All right, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for, uh, for setting up this panel. Uh, I think it's really important to have agribusiness in this conversation. Um, as Matt said, it's really critical to future conservation to have um, everyone at the table. Um, so I'm really excited by our panelists here. Uh, we've got Simon Lohr from Simon Darby, which is a major uh, Malaysian palm oil producer. Uh, we've got uh, Lucita Jasmine, um, who's with April, which is a major pulp and paper company that primarily operates in Indonesia. Uh, we have Rudy Brucha, who is the 2014 winner of the Goldman Environmental Prize, which is like uh, the Nobel Prize for environmental activism, um, for his work in uh, producing the Laoser uh, ecosystem in Sumatra. And then we have Janice Lee, who's a researcher focused on ecological impacts of land use change. Um, so I'm going to start by providing a little context. Um, so as I mentioned, um, plantation development is a major, one of the biggest drivers of land use change, uh, especially uh, forest loss and peatlands uh, conversion in Southeast Asia. Um, so in Asia, we're primarily talking about uh, pulp and paper, timber, uh, oil palm, and rubber. Um, in the Amazon, it's more about um, conversion for cattle, cattle pasture, and soy. And Africa's a different story. It's less about industrial drivers deforestation, but um, essentially it's mostly oil palm and, and rubber if you're looking at uh, agribusiness there. Um, so this is, so because this has been such a big driver of deforestation for a long time, it's been a major focus for activist groups and conservationists. Um, but things are changing. So there's been a lot of you know campaigns and things like that. Um, so in recent years, a number of major corporations have uh, launched these so-called zero deforestation commitments. And so generally, zero deforestation means there are several components. There's, this, there's social and environmental safeguards, so things like free prior informed consent in interacting with communities, um, a commitment to not convert peatlands, and then um, also a commitment not to convert um, high conservation value um, areas, so that's HCV, that's an important acronym, that probably come up a lot. Uh, and then also HCS, which is high carbon stock areas, so that would be peatlands. Um, there's still a lot of debate over what that actually means. So some companies have a certain position on what H HCV means or HCS means. So that's an ongoing debate that uh, may come out in this conversation. Um, so companies are now moving from the commitment phase to the implementation phase, which is a lot more difficult. Um, governments haven't necessarily been supportive of, of these commitments. So um, the Malaysian government has classified oil palm plantations as a state secret. So you can actually um, uh, have a lot of trouble if you publish these maps. Uh, so the RSPO, the Brownsville System of Palm Oil, has run this issue quite a bit. Um, and then the Indonesian government has uh, classified the Indonesian Palm Oil Pledge, which is a group of large um, palm oil producers and traders as a cartel. Um, and as of today, um, IPOP, which, is, which that is known as, will probably be disbanded. So um, there's a lot of concerns about that. Um, so with that background, I'd like to start the, the, debate, the discussion here. Um, so we're going to open with Simon. Um, so Simon Darby is one of the companies that has established as your deforestation commitment. Um, your prior company, which was New Britain Palm Oil, was one of the first to uh, establish one of these zero deforestation agreements um, several years ago. Um, so I wanted to have you, I wanted to see if you could take us through that process of, of developing that policy, you know, why you decided to do that, um, what it means for your business, and how you're implementing the policy operationally. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Is it good? Yeah, it is good. Um, even the cheap seats. <laughs> I think the first thing I have to say is that when you start developing a policy like that, it's, it's a hard slot. I mean, the first thing is you know, the outside never trusts you. I mean, we are big business, and when you look at the trust indices, big business is right down there with government. Whereas NGOs, be they social or environmental, are right up at the top in people's consciousness of, of levels of trust. So I think the first thing is there's external distrust when you start on this process. But there's also something that, that Eric didn't touch on in yesterday's opening speech, which is the internal dissension. Uh, not everybody in a company believes in sustainability. Uh, most of the people in the plantation industry are what would be referred to as Generation Jones. Uh, uh, really a grabbing me, me, me type of attitude. They're not Generation Y and they're not Generation X. They've not yet come through to those senior positions. So very conservative with a big C. 
go to the, the details of it now. I think New Britain Palm Oil operated in Papua New Guinea uh, over 40 odd years, so it started in the 1960s. It already had a number of very high uh, standards of environmental protection, simply because a lot of it was ex British planters who had gone over there, and the terrain and the difficulties were, were very difficult to operate. For example, we never burned to clear land. I'd like to say my forefathers were very, very environmentally conscious. The answer is they weren't. The rainfall of over four meters meant that the ground conditions were just too wet to burn. But we maintained that standard, and when we moved into the Solomon Islands and into the drier parts of Papua New Guinea, we've still maintained that no burn policy. So that has really been nearly five decades of no burning. Sign Derby, the company that's taken us over, and I've only been with Sign Derby now for 16 months, has had a no burn policy for three decades. And that's been the basis, I think, of a lot of our no deforestation, no peat, and no exploitation. People now refer to it as a four letter acronym NDPE no deforestation, no peat no exploitation. And those big three have, I think, steered the way that we have thought in terms of our policies. <coughs> so our policies cover E, S and G, the environmental, the social and the governance. Governance is very important when you're looking at a policy by a big company. The way it's structured, the way that sustainability has a voice, and where exactly that voice is heard, is very, very important in the context of the company. So when you're engaging with them, and I'm talking about engagement uh, later on in this conference, it's important to look how the structure is. That's why we always talk about ESG, and when you talk about in reporting on the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, your sustainability reports that come out, they always talk about ESG as well. I think, Brett, without going on too long, is that really the policy is very hard, uh, it goes against the grain, you have to convince people, and it's never right. It never satisfies my internal stakeholders, I'm going too far, and it never satisfies my external stakeholders, we're not going far enough. But there is a limit to how fast the company can travel. I've learned, New Britain Palm Oil, I've been doing this for 30 years, 20 years with New Britain Palm Oil, it was a very nimble company, and we could move very quickly. Sign Derby is enormous. New Britain Palm Oil fits into Sign Derby as 4.5% of Sign Derby's business. It's actually just 10% of its plantations. And to turn an organization as big as that, to get those wheels going, I mean, sometimes I do describe it, I get shot for this, but I do describe it like trying to nail jelly to a wall. It's not easy at all. Uh, but once you get a juggernaut beginning to move, then it is a real game changer in the whole arena. You're right about the Official Secrets Act. I've been threatened with the Official Secrets Act in Malaysia. Uh, I have been threatened also in Indonesia, because we have operations in Indonesia, in all the way in when we talk about transparency. We have a very transparent system. We're skating very, very close to the limits of the law. Uh, we will not break the law. A company our size can't afford to do that. And when you hinted about the fact of IPOP, and in this seat there should really be a, a lady called uh, Dr. Petra Mikas, who would have been able to tell you more in detail about IPOP. An organization of forward-thinking companies. Sign Derby was not a member. It, it doesn't have that big operations in Indonesia. But the Indonesians got together and they really tried to put onto this world a overarching policy of pre-competitive collaboration, which was a game changer. And as, as Rhett hinted, it's been shut down. It's been closed off. And it's been seen as a cartel, as an antitrust, price fixing. All those kind of things will start to come out in the media, not in yours, I hope, which aren't true. It was never set up as a cartel, it wasn't about price fixing. 
it was about pushing the boundaries. Yeah, so part of the goal of IPOP was to encourage the government to then adopt policies that would be supportive of, of, of conservation. Yeah, and please lobby the government to be supportive. Uh, so we see that um, Simon mentioned governance. Um, a lot of the places where you operate essentially don't have much governance. There's not much government around, and when it, when it is around, it may not do very much. Um, so what is the private sector role in governance, uh, or uh, so what is the private sector role in conservation in places where there is very little governance? Um, thank you, Red. Uh, good morning, everyone. Magenta Mo Magazine in Lahatwitz, Filipino for a beautiful morning to all of you. So um, I think, um, again, referring to the keynote address of Dr. Mayer yesterday, delivered yesterday, he concluded with the remarks. Of, okay. Is this close yeah. enough? All right, sure. It's a little tricky at the angle of the mic. <laughs> so I, I, I think his conclusion um, yesterday set the tone for this conversation quite appropriately when he said there are opportunities for conservation with business. And one, is, one such opportunity would be basically in how um, private sector can support conservation initiatives. Now, there are several ways that we are doing that, and I'm going to cite a few examples. Um, the first is, as he mentioned in the aspect of governance, uh, private sector can actually uh, play a role in putting in place a system for active management of protection and protection of conservation areas. Um, in a developing economy context like Indonesia, one would expect that there would be um, several types of risks um, that um, conservation areas are actually subjected to, whether this be the risk of encroachment, the risk of illegal logging, or illegal conversion, mainly through burning. So um, based on our experience, more than two decades of experience um, in, in Sumatra, um, yes, it does help a lot for a conservation area to thrive or even to survive for it to have or to be part of a, a, a system of management and protection. Now, the second role that the private sector can play, of course, is in identifying and addressing the root causes or the socioeconomic pressures that are actually causing the risks to forest resources. And one of the ways that we do that is by actually developing economic alternatives for the communities, um, enabling the communities with skills, providing them support, uh, creating employment, so that eventually, I guess, or ultimately, the objective is to alleviate the the pressure on forest resources coming from social economic um, reasons. Um, but these two uh, examples are rather fundamental with the operations that we do. Now, where it gets um, uh, a little bit more interesting, particularly with this community, I suppose, is that the private sector can actually support with its resources. It has the resources, it has the motivation, the incentive to actually uh, work with the scientific community on research regarding Conservation, how could we better do this? Now, in our company alone, we have 38 PhDs, and I guess there are 160 science-related or scientific jobs. Uh, we've been working uh, in partnership, for example, with conservation institutions like the Fauna and Flora International or the Nature Conservancy. We have recently just established what we call an independent peat expert working group, which is basically a collection of of peat scientists from all over the world. And we are actually seeking their advice, opening up the operations of the company to them for their review so that they can come back with us with recommendations on how to move forward with this. Basically what is happening is that um, part of the strategy now is to strengthen the interface between science and policy, science and practice, even within the private sector. Now, what, why is this happening? Why are we turning to science uh, much more increasingly these days. Because I think our approach to conservation is also evolving. Um, we all started, for example, with just perhaps dealing with the complying with, with the regulation, for example, like when we started in the early 90s, the Indonesian government was simply requiring 10%, setting aside 10% of your concession for conservation. But then, from, and, and we were all just looking at individual concessions. Now from there we moved on, for example, in pioneering a commitment called the High Conservation Value Commitment. Now this is a voluntary commitment that's adopted by companies. And then eventually, of course, the, the approach has evolved to now even include the high carbon stock, as was mentioned earlier. 
now and now we're all learning to, to advance towards the landscape approach. Just a week ago, we had a meeting with our stakeholder advisory committee that involves some of our critical uh, stakeholders, uh, Greenpeace and WWF, and we were actually looking at a whole map of all, of all our concessions where we have um, identified or delineated for them where the conservation areas are. Because now we're having to re-rationalize how the conservation areas have been mapped out. And they just try to see if there's a way with where we can, in fact, optimize the conservation value instead of just looking at isolated patches of conservation in different concession areas. Are the connectivities working? Are the wildlife corridors working? Are we better off actually you know, uh, putting them together in one location or, or, or closer to a particular park? So this type of re-rationalization is happening. Now, um, as a final point, I guess, what is, what is the driver for, for all this? I think we are starting to see a business case for, for conservation. Yesterday's um, presentation by Dr. Bayard also said something like, is, this a, a, is, is there an aspect of greenwashing to this? Now, if you ask us where it's not greenwashed, it's where it actually makes business sense. Because when it is part of a business strategy, it is institutionalized. And it is actually delivered on. Why is it making business sense for us? Because we're now seeing that the plantations don't, don't exist in isolation. They're actually part, or they are, they're actually part of a bigger landscape. What happens in the conservation area eventually feeds into the health of the plantations. We're looking at the overall ecosystem services. We're now starting to see the value of the natural capital. We're now starting to see the value of the ecosystem services and you know, increasingly incorporating this into the long-term valuation of the business. So I, you know, so I, I guess beyond governance and, and looking at a, a broader view to sustainability and conservation being a critical component of that, um, private sector is increasingly playing a role in, in, in this area. Uh, thanks. Uh, so Rudy, we've heard about these commitments from the private sector, um, but they, can they actually be trusted to implement these policies? Um, and what is the role of civil society and activist groups in shifting these industries towards less damaging practices? Thank you. Um, yeah, about the zero deforestation, that is the, the interesting point in, in, uh, in our uh, rules to protect the Indonesian forest, but uh, um, yeah, I believe this will be implemented in, in the future, but when, the question is when, maybe after all of the Indonesian forest will die. Um, because right now, deforestation still happens in Indonesia, and, and there is no control from the government uh, to stop this. And maybe in the future, maybe some of the companies will follow this, this, uh, the rules to our commitment to zero deforestation. But uh, Indonesia also have the, the thousand of the plantation, the companies, the other uh, companies. This is no, we don't follow the system or the the good system for the environmental. The still burning, the still. Uh, clearing the forest, and like no, almost all Indonesian forests, there is extinct outside of the national park or protected forest, and also in based on our experience, um, in many places like the production forest where the logging concession can uh, uh, operating in that location, that uh, the government also can release this this forest to be uh, plantation, uh, timber plantation. So uh, this is worse in, in, uh, in the future. And I don't believe that the zero deforestation will be happen in, in, uh, in the future. Uh, and our problem also about the small order uh, plantation that is small scale, but the, because in the one location, thousands of people Encroach the forest. That is uh, make our forest is extinct. And that's why, in our principle, we not against the palm oil. We only against the palm oil or rubber 
are proper uh, when you destroy the forest because the impact for the deforestation is for directly to the coward communities. And like no, this is one example. In our province, in Aceh, Aceh province, the government allocated around the 50 million US dollar per year to help to dealing with the mitigation, natural disasters, especially with uh, flooding. And this is the impact from deforestation. This is not only by the palm oil, but uh, also the rubber and other uh, activities inside the forest. And and in fact, our communities is poor. In Aceh, more than 15% of the communities still live under of the government's uh, 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 for uh, level. So, but in Aceh, around the 1.2 million hectares farm oil in that location, that is 20% of Aceh province uh, the area. And one district in, in Aceh, this is my, my district in Aceh Tamiya. In the total, the, the area only around the 200,000 hectares, but palm oil almost 100,000 hectares. This 50% of the, our district is occupied by the palm oil. But 50% of 15% of our communities is still poor. So the, the, the district said this the palm oil is not give the positive impact for the economy, for the local economy. And yeah, that uh, has happened if, if, uh, right now in our, our region and also province, in, I think in general Indonesia. Um, this is uh, very clear, our role is about the, against the deforestation. And yeah, I hope in the future the the, the key point is government, not the plantation or the companies, I guess. Because uh, if government is very clear to say this, there is no more for the palm oil or the the forest basin, this is really good for the forest of Indonesia. And uh, yeah, right now the government of Jokowi and also the provincial government in Aceh declared for the moratorium uh, for the mining and the palm, uh, mean mining and the palm oil for the new permit, but the problem is the old permit, the former permit, they can still clear it. And this is thousand, a uh, million of the hectare will convert to the, the palm oil. And last week, the Aceh government also released the, the letters to the, the companies to stop, stop the, um, the clearing inside of the local ecosystem. But by me, this is not enough too, because uh, our problem, not only palm oil, but also the others, activities uh, to change our forest to be armed forest. I think um, this is, uh, from me, this is very clear, because if we not against the palm oil, we only against the activities where they destroy the forest. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rudy. Um, so, so Janice, you're the, you're, you're the uh, scientist on the panel here. Um, what does the science say about balancing uh, agro-industrial production versus maintenance of ecosystem services, biodiversity, and, and forests? Um, so, yeah, thank you, Ren. Um, I think Rudy pointed out a good uh, issue, which is that um, at the end of the day, it's really about clearing of the habitats and also uh, causing deforestation from all these agro-industrial production. And uh, when we look at new industrial production, I think it's very clear that uh, such development should not occur at the expense of lot or intact forests because uh, there are many studies that show that all these habitats are very depopulated compared to, in terms of their biodiversity levels compared to agro-industry, uh, agro-industrial monocultures. So in terms of new uh, production lands, uh, these kinds of developments should stay clear from um, places which are rich in biodiversity as well as carbon stocks. Um, there, are, there are many different studies over the last few decades that have shown the kind of impacts that um, all these monoculture agro-industrial plantations have on uh, biodiversity as well as uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, fires, um, water pollution, 
because of fertilizer use as well as the mill production. Um, so the environmental impacts are pretty clear. Um, but I think the kind of uh, research questions that um, that researchers are kind of moving from uh, questions looking at the impacts of these uh, production systems towards how can we mitigate or how can we look into managing the production system such that we can try to reduce the impacts uh, with on existing plantations. So we already know, or say for example, if we're looking towards opening up new plantations, it's very clear that you know these habitat systems which are very rich in biodiversity and carbon should not be touched, especially peatlands. Um, but if we're looking at really trying to meet production targets and also trying to uh, provide rural um, economic development, then we should definitely look into lands which are not so rich in carbon and also biodiversity. And there are some, um, I think, government plans as well as um, uh, NGO work that are trying to identify these degraded areas and to encourage uh, local community as well as uh, comp partnerships with companies to develop these lands for production. So in terms of um, the studies or the questions that I think most of the community or most of the scientists in, in this uh, field are asking is really moving away from you know measuring the impacts, although there are still some impacts that are not well understood, for example the aquatic biodiversity issue, um, and moving towards like how to mitigate or how to enhance the environment such that uh, we can ensure that um, some of these ecosystem services as well as uh, biodiversity can thrive in the agro-industrial systems. So one example uh, I can think of is uh, the work that's coming from, that came from um, one of our PhD students in Princeton, and he looked at the buffer zones around um, these oil palm plantations and how they can be a positive uh, impact on the aquatic biodiversity. Um, I think there was also another study that looked at how uh, some of these oil palm plantations shouldn't be grown close to rivers as well as floodplains because it would be an economic loss to them due to the flooding issues. Uh, and it's also bad for uh, water pollution. So, um, yeah, so there is a, a clear move, moving away from, from these questions, um, and, or rather a, an evolution of the questions from just simply measuring the impacts and looking more towards the mitigation side of, uh, of agro-industrial development. Uh, thanks, Janice. Um, so, Simon and Lucy, um, your companies have cleared a lot of forests over the years, like both your companies and your suppliers. Um, why is it different now? Are, are these impacts that Janice was talking about, are they actually having an impact? Are they, are they affecting your, your business case now? Um, things like haze, um, is that bad for reputation? Are you reacting to that? Or, you know, why, why, are, you, why are your companies changing now? Well, I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, so, I mean, I have not changed. Uh, certainly the companies that I represent and work for are beginning to change. I, I do keep reminding Simon Darby that, that it's only a small change in its name before it becomes Simon Darby. Uh, it's not going down too well with the board at the moment. The, I think the change came, really, uh, with the dawn of the RSPO. Now, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Round Table on Sustainable Palm Oil. I was one of the original architects of it. A multi-stakeholder group. I believe Daryl will be talking about this. He's the current CEO, used to be called Secretary General. It defines sustainability with a set of eight principles, which covered everything from transparency and legal to best practice to best social practice to what you do with new developments, and that's why I want to come and link back to it. And if I wander off, you'll, you'll bring me back, I know. Uh, it didn't just define principles. It took those principles into practices. It bundled around the principles some 41 criteria which allowed expression of what the aspiration were of those principles, and then it concreted them by actually setting key performance indicators, auditable indicators that third parties can walk into a plantation and have objective evidence that you are expressing the intention of those principles. Now that's a good standard. 
There's an even better standard, it's called the Sustainable Agricultural Network, or SAN standard. Uh, that didn't, at that time, apply to palm oil and was only to smaller scale farms. This started in around about 2002, the first idea. By 2004, the Round Table was a, an organization that was actually living. And by 2008, there was a standard. And now, today, some 20% of the industry is under this particular standard. That's higher than FSC. It's, it's higher than Marine Stewardship Council. It's higher than any other uh, sustainable standard in the world. But it's still 20% which means 80% is exactly what you were saying, outside of that limit. I think the bigger companies, the more forward-looking companies, if you go down that list, are the ones that are following that standard. And indeed, there's now something called RSP or Next. But before there was RSP or Next, there was something else. And I have to be honest, we're not very good at names. It's called POIG, Palm Oil Innovation Group. Yeah, we're really crap at naming things, I have to be honest. But the Palm Oil Innovation Group was Greenpeace, Rainforest Action Network, Forest People's Program, WWF, my company, New Britain Palm Oil, a small company in Brazil called AgriPalma, and an even smaller company in Colombia called Dabon. We came together because during the review of the standard of the RSPO, it didn't go far enough as far as we were concerned. Now that was the forward thinking, the innovative group. And that is even a smaller percentage of that 20%. We still haven't got to the tipping point. And everybody thinks it's the big companies. You talk about Hayes. I mean, yes, Singapore, please bring on prosecutions. Because the prosecutions will allow those maps to be produced in court which will actually exonerate, I think, many of the larger companies. And you will really begin to see where the fires are. If you're interested, you can watch the fires in real time. Uh, and Global Forest Watch on its website, WRI, there is a dashboard that's using the NASA satellite imagery. My own company does it and puts out reports on it. RSPO uses to monitor it. So you can actually see it in real time. And not in real time, but you can also see the degree of deforestation on their website. So just remember that Global Forest Watch. Google it and look at their websites. Why are we changing? I think we actually got the spear in the chest moment a lot earlier. I think we started to believe in these things. I always say there's three types of people in sustainability. There's the missionaries, the people that really, really believe in it. There's the mercenaries, the people that only see the business case, and there is a business case. And then there's the misfits, uh, Glenn, people that are actually going to do it anyway, uh, because that's exactly what they feel like. So, some people, the business case, and the business case is just simply follow the money. Look at what the customers are asking. And then wonder why the customers who buy our oil are asking for these kind of things. And the reason is NGOs. The people that run the customer facing, the consumer goods, the fast moving consumer goods, the people that buy the products that we produce and then sell them are frightened to death that there'll be a campaign against them. Now, it is not generally the public that starts these campaigns. It's the advocacy groups. And that's the role that they play, and it's a very, very important role. So if you want to get things changed with the 80% of the industry that's not following any kind of standard, that is still opening up areas of pea, and we should never have planted on pea. It is still cutting down, not primary forest, although some of them are, but indeed, young regenerating forest and not giving it a chance to recover. There are indeed social practices which are far below not just a decent living wage, but the minimum wage. There is bondage. Uh, the UK has just passed the modern day slavery act. Who would have thought in 2015 when it came in that we would ever talk about modern day slavery? I know it's a biodiversity 
conference, but you also have people in the title as well. All of these things are happening today. There is modern day slavery. There is exploitation. There is still planting on peat. There is still deforestation. It's not happening in the 20%. Yes, I know we've had a few cases of rogue players. You could expect that. It's happening in the 80%. Promote good practices and beat to death those that are doing bad practices. And we always get it wrong. We never ever praise the people that have actually got it right. And then what that's doing is a disincentive. You have a chance here to change people's views, to walk away from this conference, and to think about what I've said, and to say, I wonder if there are companies that should be encouraged and identified as different from countries and companies that should be absolutely jumped upon. Thanks, so. Um, um, I think in my view, basically, the, co the company's responses are um, a factor of how, you know, how the times have also been evolving and in terms of what's available to us in terms of best practices, in terms of standards. When we started with our operations in the early 90s, I think we were also, um, at, the, at least in our part of the industry, the first to even adopt the Nobert policy, and that was in 1994 for us. You know, I mean, because at that time, in most parts of the country, it's, it's almost legal, in fact, to, to use fire. And it, it, has, it has even a big, um, um, I, I, I guess, even seen as a, um, as a pioneering effort on the part of the company to even adopt that, that policy. When we adopted the high conservation value uh, commitment, the toolkit for Indonesia wasn't available yet then. So I guess as companies are starting to to learn and to open up to new standards, then of course the, the practices and the policies also change. I guess there's also a recognition that eventually, even when we operate in, in, in Indonesia, we are as much a part of the global system. And as we continue to, uh, to embrace that, um, then we become, of course, engaged not just with the local stakeholders, but then with the international stakeholders. Market access is also a particular incentive to this, because, of course, there, um, as we become much more global in, in our approach and, and with the distribution of our products, then we are also having to respond to some of the standards that are also uh, expected of us by the, the global north, and which to an extent, despite the challenges that we have in actually effectively uh, uh, adopting this in the global south, but these are standards that, are, that we're having to deal with and that we are also um, responding to. You mentioned as well, of course, that there is now an increasing recognition of, of the business case. I think uh, companies, I mean, the business is maturing to an extent that it is already seeing, you know, even to, even at a, a, at a longer term than it normally would. And with that longer term understanding of really what is going to make this, this business sustainable over the next uh, 50 down to 100 years, then um, yes, then, it, it, then also there's a, a broader approach to what the sustainability of the business is all about beyond just what the operations um, actually also require. So, uh, so we've heard about these commitments and companies, you know, say they're changing. Um, how? So what would be next? Let's say these zero deforestation policies work, and you want to look kind of moving forward. So start talking about things like restoration of ecosystems. So um, Rudy, what what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you've you've had some, you've done some of this work with the oil palm in Tenace, but um, also more broadly, you know, how how do you start to sort of reverse the damage that's been done in these ecosystems over the past 20 or 30 years? Um, yeah, in those other ecosystems, it's around uh, 100,000 hectares is occupied by the palm oil. Uh, some of them is legal because um, they got the permit before the lesser ecosystem studies. But around 50% uh, of this uh, palm oil is illegal. That's why we need to restore the forest and we work with the communities and governments. And yeah, we try to um, to start this with the deforest, uh, reforestation 
with cutting down the palm oil, and the forest is easier to come back. Um, in our experience, in on the without the intervention, human intervention, in nine, in only in five years the forest come back and the wild species also come back, easier to come back. And we find the tiger, elephant, and orangutan in the restoration site. And also our our college in North Sumatra also doing the same thing. And yes, in in the south. Almost the majority in forest in Indonesia is easier to come back by themselves. Uh, but yeah, we need uh, more more uh, reforestation, and I think in the future that uh, uh, if the zero deforestation is happen, I think the companies, the big companies or the small companies, can work with the communities small order because right now in in Aceh or Indonesia this small order only they they have the land they they own the land but the productivity of the palm oil is very low. In in Aceh only one month per one hectare only maximum two two tons per, per month per one hectare. In the dry season only one ton per month. So I think the in the future, this is good if the, uh, the the companies can work together with the small order, not the encroach forest, but work with them to increase the productivity of the palm oil in their lands. And and that's why that we don't need the the expansion of the palm oil anymore. And. Um, yeah, this is the, the real problem in in our region. That like, no, is not about the companies, but this is about the communities. This uh, the biggest uh, threat right like, now, because uh, after the government uh, declared there is no new permit for the inside of the user ecosystem, but the clearing still happen by the, the communities, by the the rich persons, and. Yeah, that's why I think uh, the companies also need to track the, especially with the, by, by the meal, the uh, plantation meal, to track their the source of the fruit, of the palm oil, and they have to stop to purchase the palm oil from the from the forest, and and the other thing is. Uh, how communities can import and agree for the zero deforestation. That's why we need the government hand to um, to stop this. Uh, I think that's uh, from from. Uh, thanks, Reed. Um, so, so Janice, large parts of Riau and South Sumatra are essentially ecological disaster zones now. You've had the water tables drained. Um, so if we start a fire, you can't put it out. All this haze is you know, coming to Singapore on a fairly regular basis. So how, how do we move beyond that, that, that world towards something where you're actually having productive ecosystems? And um, you know, how are scientists quantifying that and try to figure out you know, what's next? And what sort of, par are there partnerships being formed with companies to sort of understand what's str strategic and what needs to happen? Um, so with regards to the peatlands, which are pretty much devastated by draining and also plantation development. Um, I think there are some programs which are working with communities to try to encourage communities to ensure that there will not be any uh, burning activities within their own village land uh, for, the, for the peatlands which are in their own villages. Um, with regards to restoration of peatlands, I think that's something that is a very challenging aspect of uh, restoration work because the peatland ecosystem is very sensitive and this was something that was made aware when I went for a conference in Berlin and it was a ton of uh, peatland experts and I myself, um, you know, living in Singapore and having Indonesia just, you know, close by never really understood the kind of uh, how fragile and how vulnerable this ecosystem is um, you know, how the water table is actually kind of like sustained by the trees that are on these systems 
and uh, when you cut down the trees, that's really when the impact begins because the water tables start to already decrease and then um, it increases the susceptibility of uh, drying and also fires. So once peatland forests are being logged, that's actually the start of like the, the problems that are going to happen to the peat ecosystem. And then when you continue with the draining of peatlands and then the planting of uh, oil palm plantations, uh, and then you lead to land subsidence, it, it's such a difficult uh, ecosystem to restore. Um, and it is really challenging. I think people who are working on peat restoration systems are, are finding ways to try to dam up the systems and also to try to reflood the peat. Um, but it is a very, very challenging uh, aspect of restoration. Um, I think APP has a plan to restore a million hectares of uh, peatlands. And I think that's a start in terms of uh, a collaboration uh, with peat experts and uh, people who are working on the ground um, on these peat systems to try to restore these uh, systems. Um, with regards to local community participation, uh, I think at the end of the day, it's also, you know, in order to have a successful kind of uh, project going on forward and also for the long term, there is also a need to also clarify the kind of land rights which are on these systems. So if you have contestation of like uh, communities or companies, and if these things are not resolved, at the end of the day, who's going to look after the long-term kind of like restoration of these systems? So this is also something that has to be taken into consideration, uh, and that can only be solved, I guess, at the government level. Uh, thanks. So, yeah, you can respond. Um, I'm going to go to the audience uh, in a second, so it would be good to start lining up. We have a mic runner. Um, so it'd be good to think about your questions. Um, so I'm going to go to Lucy to respond to this and also Simon. And so we've got about 10 minutes left, so just do our time. Well, I, I guess I uh, just want to pick up on a couple of points. One is basically um, the point about working with the communities. I think the one thing that made a difference in last year's worst possible El Nino episode, I think, that we've, uh, we've experienced in this part of the world was that the discourse has suddenly, or the approach has suddenly, uh, has now included what is called prevention. Because I guess uh, many of the companies, not just you know, the, the rest of the public, have also started wondering because we always get the flag anyway. You know, we always uh, there's no incentive for us to burn. That is, we don't burn the basic um, resource that, that we need for, for the business, right? So, and um, and it doesn't and it, so it doesn't really make sense. But at the same time, we needed to understand the root cause. What is driving this? So telling the communities to burn is not enough. You need to, as you say, you need to actually also enable the communities. You cannot stop them from doing or pursuing their own agricultural activities. They have as much right or as much, you know, who's to say that their economic need or their economic aspiration is, is not to be fulfilled. So the, the key is actually to give, them, um, to give them the tools as well to do this, to give them the alternatives. So there's a program that we initiated called the Party Village Program. And basically what it does is that, one, it provides the villages with alternatives to land clearing, technical assistance, and at the same time it gives them incentives. If they don't burn over a particular dry season, they're actually given a reward for doing so. And the reward is something that they decide among themselves because it also depends on their need. It could be a school, it could be a clinic, it could be a mosque, and, 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 and basically also it, it comes with, with um, an educational aspect to it because the long-term objective is basically behavior change. So this is just us being able to at least get them enlisted in the program with some sort of incentive, but it's also an entry point into engaging with the communities. Because many of them, having been born into years of burning as a means of, you know, for clearing land, do not even associate it with health issues. But when we actually started installing air quality monitoring systems in some of the villages, and we explain to them, for example, what it means or how it links to the respiratory health of the children, you know, we realized, in fact, that one of the key influences in the villages became the mothers. Then the mothers started telling the, you know, the men in the community to say, do not do that, because our children are getting sick. And now, you know, so it's long-term behavior change, so that's one. Now, I guess also on the point of eco-restoration, I understand, Pita, indeed, is a very challenging, um, ecosystem to restore. Now, our company is actually already uh, in the process or has a project um, uh, uh, called Peatland uh, Ecosystem Restoration 
project, which where we're actually restoring 150,000 hectares on peat. Now, we do not claim to, to know right now the actual solution, which is why we're working with several uh, scientific institutions, conservation institutions I mentioned earlier. We're working with Fauna and Flora International. We have just asked the, the Nature Conservancy also to help us because I guess the criti one critical aspect of working with peatlands is understanding the entire landscape as a whole. We may be managing hydrologically you know, well the plantations, but at the same time, or the, the, cons the concessions that we manage, but you know, um, any neighboring on a plantation of a community that does not have proper water management skills can easily undermine whatever it is that we're doing with it or however we're protecting the ecosystem. So that initiative is already ongoing. Thanks, Ozzy. Uh, do you have a quick comment, Simon? Okay. Very quick. I totally agree with you about traceability. Unless you've got traceability and transparency in your supply chain, you're never ever going to break the link between deforestation and palm oil. And that's what you need to push for. A couple of other things to talk about. We're also in a free, free fire alliance. Uh, Sam Darby actually last year committed to going up to five kilometers beyond its boundaries. Now you might think five kilometers, yeah, hey, I walk that every day. You think of the concessions, you think of the size of land that actually covers, and then you sit down and put that on Google Maps. Five kilometers when you have a land bank of a million hectares is a phenomenal amount of land. I take a point about working that the governments are the only solution. I, I work with a lot of, of, of different governments, I work with a lot of, of different NGOs as well. And I think the solution is not in, in public-private partnerships, PPP. I think it's in public, private and people partnerships. Because a forest that pays is a forest that stays. And if we can make those forests valuable for the people, if we can make that as an alternative, and it's not just the value of the land, and it's not just what can be extracted from that forest, if we can make it viable, then that forest will stay. So people have to be involved. And part of that is really strong participatory mapping and community involvement through the ethnic process of what we're doing. That was just the two bits. The last bit is, I really think that when you go into a development, to answer an earlier question, you really need to do something like a multi-dimensional poverty assessment tool. Because we don't really have the evidence that palm oil is an economic improver yet. And I think that evidence is there, but it's not yet been gathered. Thanks, Simon. So, uh, questions from the audience. And I think we'll take um, three questions to start. Uh, sorry. Just stand up and go to the mic. Yeah. And other folks who have questions, you should start going to the mic as well. Just get in, get in line. Go ahead. Good morning, all. I, I'm, my name is Joseph. I'm with the FFI. Uh, I have several questions. The first one is, uh, is there any academic evidence on saying, for example, we have 10,000 hectares of palm oil or timber plantation, and we protect around 100 hectares of it? Will it sustain, or we need to conserve more? Um, that's just an example. So the question is, how big should a conservation area within a concession to make it sustain and, um, with scientific uh, uh, evidence, of course? And then the second one is for the private sectors. So how far would the private sectors go if, for example, again, um, the should be protected areas is included on the production line. For example, on on a peat ecosystem, they are, are connected with they're really hydrologically connected peatland, and on the edge of the peatland, uh, it's been planted with uh, palm oil or probably timber plantation, and it happens to be. Uh, a land that needs to be protected to maintain the cost. So how far the private sector would go? Would they shut down the production on their areas or what? And then the third one is for the community palm oil in Aceh or in Leuser. So it's 
the, the good things of having RSPO for big companies is they have liabilities if they clear HEV areas. But it's not that straightforward for small scale or small holders, uh, palm oil uh, plantation. So is there any, from your experience, is there any um, effective way on approaching the community on not to clear or to do a really good uh, small holder uh, palm oil plantation management? I think that's it. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. So we'll take your question. Hi, Tom Gray from Wildlife Alliance in Cambodia. So your um, plantations and concessions aren't necessarily bad habitat for charismatic megafauna like tigers and elephants. So how do you deal with human-wildlife conflict? And also do you, and I guess more importantly, your employees in your concessions, view having elephants and tigers in your concessions as a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, thank you. So those are the questions. Uh, does anyone want to start? And we're, we're pretty low on time, so I'd say keep the responses relatively short. Uh, with regards to the academic evidence on biodiversity being sustained in the concession, uh, I think um, biodiversity is a very broad term. You can think about fungus, you can think about tigers. Um, there, there isn't really, I think, uh, it, it really depends on the, the type of species that you're talking about. But there is a set kind of methodology that's being developed, or has been developed, it's called the high carbon stock approach. And it's quite a systematic way of trying to identify the types, and not just the area, but also the quality of your forests that are remaining or in the concession that has been given to you. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good approach. I can recommend you to read it up on, uh, online. And uh, they basically use remote sensing information as well as uh, look at the, uh, what, what previous research has shown about say patch size or patch connectivity to try to identify what's the best approach in order to conserve your best forest uh, and also the, the kind of area that you're talking about within the concession. All right, um, just on the question on, you know, um, how, how big a conservation initiative do you have to, to match your, basically the, the approach that we did is just we just did a one for one. For every hectare that we planted, we're committed to conserve an equivalent hectare. And then of course we're now in the process, of course, of actually trying to understand whether the math actually adds up. And so, which means actually uh, doing an assessment, again, doing a full assessment of the high conservation value, the high carbon stock and, and, and such. How far will private sector go? Uh, I think the willingness is there. The fact that we are willing to undertake um, a landscape assessment, for example, of our plantations and to review where is the optimal, or, or, you know, how holistically can we actually map this out and where is that optimal point where there's a balance across the different values, whether this be economic, conservation, social, you know, that we, we, we are willing to look into that and to just see what actually would, would work as, as far as the entire landscape is, is concerned. Wildlife conflict, okay, in the eco, well, uh, I mentioned earlier that of course, um, one, of the, the, one of the areas where we are very concerned about is protecting our conservation areas and particularly the eco uh, restoration system where we were, FFI is undertaking a biodiversity survey. And we are even very reticent about publishing some of the results of our biodiversity survey because we know we don't want to announce what type of wildlife we are actually also finding in the ecosystem for fear of in, you know, inviting um, uh, encroachers or hunters in, into the area. There's a, an active system of, uh, of patrol. Uh, we have recruited community members, in fact, to serve as forest rangers, former illegal loggers, and some of them actually even former illegal loggers have been converted to become protectors of the forest, and which is also a good signal for the rest of the community as well, providing them um, not just economic alternatives, but a way to shift their mindset on how to appreciate the forest better. Do we, well, we do have, you know, conservation is, is a big aspect of the, the policy of the company. Um, this is something, of course, that we, we um, try to socialize as best as we can with our employees. It's a challenge because, of course, um, elephants, okay, um, uh, elephants are much less, I think, of a concern than tigers would be in the concessions. And, uh, but um, it's not like, uh, you know, we, we don't, we, we, I, I, think the, I think the best way to do this is that basically 
we, we find ways to have connectivity and wildlife corridors so that we are able to make sure that the wildlife across the plantations are actually able to go through the, the conservation areas and the rest of the habitats. Yeah. Uh, right now, in all of the communities under stress because uh, I, I say this is sick because uh, they jealous with the companies, they jealous with the rich person. That's why, because uh, the government allow the companies to encroach the forest to change the forest to be farm wild, and after that the communities also follow this. But uh, the communities uh, encroach the forest by illegal, and the companies can uh, process the permit to release. Uh, forest uh, to be unforest and after that planting with the palm oil and that's why very difficult to encourage the communities but we have the opportunities because the flooding and natural disaster and that's why when we start this program in 2006 this is the biggest flooding in Aceh that's around the 2 million US 2 billion US dollar loss for the seven days of the flood and after that, we talk with the communities. You see the uh, the, the impact of the, uh, the the flooding. This is because of the deforestation in your forest. That's why we need you need to restore your forest. And after that, we uh, start with the, so many formal meeting with the communities and and to make them understand. And so that is more easier to follow. But some of the people, we cannot uh, control for the, all of the communities because the loser is very, very wide. And in the larger area, um, the other communities still encroach the forest. And, and this is difficult. And we only can work in the small area in one district. And right now we start to the other district. And until today we, we work for the three districts in, in loser. And the communities right now is quite understand, but some of them is still encroach the forest. And the problem also, the encroachment not from the local communities, but they come from the other city, like 90% uh, of the illegal plantation in Aceh Tamiang district, is, this is, they're from, not from Aceh, but from North Sumatra, the rich person or also the, uh, the small order. But they don't know about the forest, where the forest, where uh, they encroach, and more and more. That's why in this case, uh, we work with the police and the forest department to arrest them or stop the uh, clearing. And the second about the human wildlife conflict, that is, I think that is very interesting because uh, in last uh, 20 years ago, there is no human any human elephant conflict in in our region, or, or, or only for the small small conflict. But after the communities and plantation come to Aceh and planting with the palm oil, after that uh, the elephant and the tiger uh, make a conflict because uh, palm oil is the favorite fruit for the elephant, and right now we talk. There is no, we cannot work, we cannot, communities and or plantation and the uh, uh, elephant cannot live in one location, one area. That's why we need the demarcation between where the elephant and where the communities, uh, where the uh, plantation like that. But the plantation should be allocate uh, the habitat for the wetland. Not only for the small area, but it's for larger area. Thanks, Reed. So we're, we're over time, but uh, Simon, this is dangerous, but I'll give you the last word. I'm um, sorry, we don't have time for more questions. I just have one, one question, please, Greg. I'm standing up here. Um, just quickly for the private sector. Um, you say that, um, don't you think that there's a disconnect between what you're trying to achieve in terms of sustainability, no deforestation, and the reality of your business of um, pursuing growth, pursuing, uh, we hear that, for example, um, um, the uh, paper industry is um, uh, creating uh, uh, bigger mills, uh, more outputs, 
Um, so you'll have to have more wood fiber to feed these mills. Um, the oil palm industry itself is also pursuing expansion, more growth, more plantations. So how do you how do you reconcile this, please? I'd like to know. Yeah, so we're, we're over time, so um, like just a few seconds, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay, take it very quickly. Tigers, elephants, good. Tigers, elephants in plantations, bad. The human wildlife conflict exists. We haven't got a full handle on it. Three things in Kulin, in Johor, I work with the Kulin Wildlife Defenders, anti-poaching. We have arrested a number of gangs through Interpol by turning the night watchmen into anti-poachers. That's one example of that. The Pongu Alliance, where I work with the orangutans, where NGOs and the oil palm industry are working on that one. Tigers Alive, which I also work with and just starting with. You want to see uh, academic evidence. Jen Lucy of the University of York, and in fact, Glenn Reynolds is sat here as well. They can give you some of the evidence as how big should a fragmented forest be in order to survive. Some of that thinking and work has gone into the high carbon stock approach. I urge you to read it as well. There's a patch analysis which talks about connection and con connectivity. If any one of you can tell me what is the right size for a riparian buffer zone, I'd be really, really pleased to hear. In Malaysia, it's 10 meters. In Papua New Guinea, I use 50 meters. In Liberia, I'm using 100 meters. Because we have to define the function. Is it a buffer zone? Is it a riparian established zone? Or is it a wildlife corridor? Go to your other bit, which is um, Eric Mayhart, I think, covered it yesterday. We have to stabilize the situation before you start getting companies to start repairing. Is there an appetite in many companies to actually go back and restore these lands? Not yet. You're sat in an auditorium. This auditorium was a primary forest. It then became a plantation of coconut, and now it's an institute of learning. And your last question. Yes, we are pursuing growth. We have shareholders. <coughs> Uh, my company in particular has 14 million individual small shareholders. They're the mums and pops. That's what a government-linked company in, in Malaysia does. They are also shareholders. By 2050, we're going to have 9 billion people. Agricultural production is going to have to rise by 70% to make it. In the companies I work for, I believe that what we should be doing is no more expansion but what we should be doing is intensification. Now, that leads you into, a, into an issue. At the moment, intensification, I can increase yields by threefold using conventional breeding, but it takes time to get that seed through into all of nearly 660,000 hectares. I could do it quicker, but it will still take me 27 years if I put in place a genetic modified organism system. Is the world ever going to accept that? So we have a conflict. We have to cut you off there. All right, 10 seconds. Or you... All right. I think. Okay. Literally 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, I, I guess it's, it, it's just to respond to, to that point. There are many other strategies that company are companies are pursuing in terms of growth. Our company, for example, are looking into R&D to increase productivity and at the same time into diversification into high value products. So we're no longer expanding, for, ex expanding, for example, our pulp mill capacity, we are expanding paper mill capacity. So and basically looking at high, uh, high value paper products so that we can, well, we can still grow the business without necessarily expanding our pulp mill uh, capacity at this point. Thank you very much. So thanks for uh, being a great audience and uh, you can catch up with folks in the breaks. So thanks again.